Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. I'm Jean Deville, joined as always by my co-host Blaine Curcio. In this week's episode, we discuss the recent milestones accomplished by the launch company Rocket Pi. But first, let's talk about the failure of the Kuaizhou One A rocket and the consequences on the launch company X Space and the satellite company G Space. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So, X Space, the commercial launch spinoff of the aerospace state-owned enterprise. Kasik, based in the city of Wuhan, failed its most recent launch attempt of the Kuaizhou One A rocket on December 14th, carrying two satellites of the satellite company G Space, the GSAT One A and the GSAT One B. But unfortunately, as it's often the case with Chinese launch failures, we don't really have any videos or images or just any communication from、uh, the launch company X Space to share with you, at least for now. And I think this failure is definitely a significant setback for X Space, as this represents the second failure of the Kuaizhou One A rocket in 15 months, and this brings the reliability of the rocket down to 86 percent. So 12 successful launches out of 14 attempts, and this this level of reliability is not unusual for commercial small lift rockets, and I think it's comparable, for example, to Rocket Lab's Electron rocket. They're at 20 successes out of 23 attempts. That's about 86% as well, but I think it's still a major hit for the leading commercial launch company in China. Up to now, so X Space was up to now praised for having this irreproachable level of reliability for its Kuaizhou One A rockets. And just to put that a little bit into perspective, up to September 2020, the Kuaizhou One A rocket had a reliability, had a track record of 100%. And the European in me wants to say that this makes them sort of the Ariane Five of solid fueled small lift、um, launch vehicles, but. Digressing,、um, and you have to add to that that they also failed their Kuaizhou 11 launch in September 2020. So I think that Kuaizhou, I mean X Space, could be facing some defiance from satellite companies in the months to come, as well as increasing insurance premiums. And perhaps even more seriously, I think for X Space is that this is coming at a time where we have commercial launch competition really growing in China. And just to give. A few examples of that: We had Galactic Energy just a, a week and a half or so ago complete their second、uh, successful launch in a row of the Series One rocket, and they're also planning five more launches in the coming year. And to put that into perspective as well, five launches in a single year—that's the best that X Space has done so far, and that was in 2019. So some serious competition coming from Galactic Energy. We also have iSpace that will likely attempt further launches of their Hyperbola One rocket in 2022, despite the two failed attempts in 2021. We also have Caspace that、uh, will launch the ZK One A solid field rocket in March 2022, and this is a much larger rocket. It is able to put 1.5 tons into Leo, so this rocket will be competing with X Space's. Kuaizhou 11, which is a rocket that、um, X Space still has to launch successfully. So X Space is feeling the heat both、uh, at the small lift launch vehicle segment,、uh, but also for its larger rockets. And finally, there are also you know some of the newcomers to Chinese commercial launch, like Space Pioneer, which should be testing their Tianlong rockets in 2022. We have also Rocket Pi with their Darwin One rocket, which I'll talk about at the end of the episode. And finally, there's all those medium lift liquid field rockets from iSpace, Landspace, Galactic Energy, all those usual suspects that are bound to perform their maiden launches in the coming 12 to 24 months. And this is a segment of the market that X Space does not really cover today, although they did mention in the past some vague project of a liquid field Kuaizhou two. So overall, this is a major、uh, setback for X Space, and highlights again,、uh, once again, how, as we often say, that space is hard. Although this definitely sh- is not a life-threatening situation for them. I mean,、um, they're supported by one of the biggest state-owned enterprises in China called Kasik, and they're also, after all, still the most advanced commercial launch company in China so far. If you put aside all the Long March rockets. Now, beyond X Space, I think this is also a setback for the payloads、uh, manufacturer, the satellite company G Space. So, to get into that, Blaine, you want to tell us a little bit more about this company that is led by a man called Li Shufu,、uh, who is sometimes called the Elon Musk of China. Or、uh, any thoughts on this failure of the Kuaizhou One A? 
Absolutely. And before doing so, just a small administrative point. A thanks to our good friends at Miratlis, who are not sponsoring the episode, but who have let me borrow their studio to record. So thank you to jean Edward and um, thank you to Miratlis. So before digging into the specific impact on G-Space, I think it's important to first mention other players that are likely impacted by this launch failure are all of the Chinese companies that are planning to launch their own constellations. And so up to this point, we've heard a number of times from different satellite manufacturers that the main bottleneck for them right now to deploy their satellites and to deploy these constellations is the lack of consistent launch access. And several of these companies have specifically mentioned high hopes that X-Space can ramp up production of the Kwaijo rocket series and help reduce some of this backlog. And so with this second failure of the Kwaijo 1A in their last five Kwaijo 1A attempts, uh, it's likely going to be back to the drawing board for some some time for x -Base. And just a small reminder, uh, as Jean alluded to earlier, uh, after the last Kwaijo 1A failure, it took x just over one year to return to flight. And so the delay here following this failure could be a little while. Um, and this could, uh, to, again, to Jean's earlier point, create an opening for some of these more emergent commercial launch players. But digressing uh, short to medium term, this is definitely going to contribute to a larger backlog and a larger queue uh, for different constellations or satellite manufacturers uh, to start deploying their, their satellites. So now getting to the more specific impact on G-Space. So clearly, very unfortunate development for the company, which has up to this point seen some pretty significant fits and starts with their highly ambitious space program. A space program which at different times we've heard rumors about building their own rockets, launching their own enhanced navigation constellation, and some other interesting you know, quasi-rumors. So, so again, very ambitious space program has seen some fits and starts. And so just to review a little bit, um, you know, what is the driving factor behind the G-Space space program? So G-Space's parent company, the Zhejiang Jili Holdings Group, is arguably China's leading private automaker with a market cap of around 30 billion U.S. dollars as of the time of recording, around 80,000 employees, and sales of roughly 1 million vehicles per year. And so getting to Jean's earlier point about the company chairman, Li Shufu, and his net worth of a little more than 20 billion U.S. dollars, um, he is indeed occasionally referred to as the Chinese version of Elon Musk. And there's a great deep dive article from earlier this year from Reuters that we will link in the episode notes. It's a really interesting profile. And among other things, you know, Lee is a member of the National People's Congress, and he has been rumored to be a friend or, or at least a close associate uh, to the Chinese President Xi Jinping, uh, with Xi having, of course, spent around five years as the governor of Zhejiang province, uh, which is the home of Jili. And so Lee, uh, the, the chairman, has for some time been talking about turning Jili from a car manufacturer into what we could call a sort of autonomous mobility service provider, with one of the enabling factors of this transformation being the launch of an enhanced navigation constellation, which would allow uh, vehicles to have more accurate location data and, again, therefore become sort of autonomous vehicles. And so when we look at Geely's core business, it's relatively far from the space sector, but they have put a lot of emphasis into their space program, at least in terms of funding and, and indeed in terms of launching satellites. So uh, their space program really kind of began in earnest around uh, the beginning of last year when they announced an investment of about 2.27 billion RMB, which at the time was a bit more than 300 million U.S. dollars into a highly automated satellite manufacturing facility in Taizhou in, uh, in Zhejiang province, with the factory planning to eventually have a production capacity of about 500 satellites per year. And that was meant to be made by only about 300 employees. So apparently a very high degree of automation. And I would also note that Geely has discussed having, you know, certain elements from the automotive manufacturing uh, industry, certain technological elements incorporated into their satellite manufacturing facility, which to the extent that there would be overlap, you could imagine there being some increased efficiencies there. So other components of the Geely space program up until now that are noteworthy have been the acquisition of the Chinese Academy of Sciences spin-off satellite manufacturer Space OK, and notably installing the former CEO of Space OK, Mr. Wang Yong, as the CEO of Geely's space industry subsidiary, uh, G Space, also known as uh, Shi Hong Daoyu. And in an interview last month, uh, Wang revealed some insights about the recent launch, although he obviously did not know that it was going to fail, but nonetheless revealed some interesting insights, um, notably that the two failed satellites were going to be using Geely's GSP-100 satellite platform, which is its mid-sized platform that has a mass of some few hundred kilograms up to about 500 kilograms and an intended satellite lifetime 
time of about five to seven years. And just the final interesting point I would say from the interview with Wong last month is that GSpace's team includes at least 10 experts that worked on the third generation Beidou satellite navigation constellation, which is presumably a very important factor for trying to build an enhanced navigation constellation. And also noted that, uh, you know, over the past couple of decades, China has developed what he referred to as, you know, less than 100 different models for satellites. And of that less than 100, uh, GSpace has experts within its team that have have worked on more than 40 of these platforms. So really, it seems an impressive amount of, of resources being put into this space program by GD and, and, and G-Space in terms of just the people that they're trying to hire. And indeed, I guess it would be interesting to do a bit more digging into, you know, to what extent has this created some kind of brain drain from China's traditional satellite manufacturers? Because again, you have experts from 40 of the, the different satellite models that have been built coming over to G-Space. So getting back to this week's launch failure, and where does this leave G-Space? So the company has been pretty vocal over the last handful of months over the, the approvals that they've received for such things as the mass manufacturing of satellites, uh, which that they acquired in early 2021. And I would say that, you know, by its very nature, their enhanced navigation constellation is a pretty regulatorily tricky proposition in China, given that SatNav is pretty well under the purview of the government. So the fact that we were able to get to this point of launching multiple satellites uh, from a state-owned launch site on, you know, what is effectively a state-owned rocket, uh, you know, failure notwithstanding, it seems to be an indication of some pretty strong regulatory support, or at a minimum, regulatory approval for G-Space's constellation. And I would also note that the company did mention in September of 2021 that they have begun batch manufacturing of satellites, indicating that, you know, if the launch cadence were to get good enough, if the rockets are reliable enough, they might be able to roll out their constellation pretty efficiently from here on out. And again, coming from a company that builds roughly a million cars per year, or at least sells a million cars per year, presumably most of which are built by Geely, um, you, know, you could imagine um, potentially ramping up production quite quickly. So ultimately, definitely the launch failure is a setback for G-Space, and uh, indeed the company had hoped to verify a couple of different technologies on these satellites that were going to be put into orbit. That being said, uh, they do seem to have the money, the infrastructure, the political capital in place to move forward pretty quickly once everything is indeed uh, you know lined up and in place. And I would also, last point is... Um, I would also point out that G-Space has identified a pretty clear target market for its constellation, that being its own vehicles, uh, which may make it relatively more straightforward to deploy, again, from a regulatory perspective. And so just to sum up, I think despite this recent setback, we remain pretty bullish on G-Space to deploy its constellation over the coming years. And now I guess the only question is, you know, are they going to be trusting uh, the Quadro rockets ever again? Or uh, whether, to Jean's earlier point, this is going to give an opening to some of the new and emerging commercial launch companies, uh, of which we did see one other one, a rather surprising one, make some additional headlines this week. So, Jean, unless you have any additional points on G-Space or Quaijo, be interesting to hear about uh, China's 34th uh, most recently funded launch company and uh, what they've been up to. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's uh, So let's talk about RocketPie, a company that I mentioned earlier in this episode and which has completed several milestones in, in recent days. So first, some background on this company that's definitely one of the more mysterious and unknown companies. According to most reports, most accounts, this company was founded in December 2020 in the city of Huzhou in Zhejiang province. And the company is planning to develop two rockets. You have the Darwin-1 two-stage small-lift liquid-filled rocket capable of putting 270 kilograms into LEO and a larger version with strap-on boosters, presumably called Darwin-2, able to put two tons into LEO. And the company also has offices in Beijing, which are reportedly R&D facilities. And over the past three months, things have really been accelerating for RocketPie. As we reported barely a month and a half ago on the Dongfang Hour, RocketPie signed an agreement with the rocket engine manufacturer Jojo Ingen to purchase their Lingyun and Longyun reusable Methlox liquid-filled engines, which would power the Darwin-1 rocket. And rocket engines being uh, possibly the single most complicated piece of equipment that's in a rocket, this will definitely accelerate the development of the Darwin-1 rocket, especially since these engines of Jojo Ingen seem to be reaching a certain level of maturity. And we've seen in the recent year or two, many, many hot fire test runs of their Lingyun and Longyun rockets. But now moving more on to the new stuff that happened over the past week or two. In early December, the company RocketPie raised a new round of funding worth 
tens of millions of RMB in an Angel Plus round from a fund called Hainan Thousand Billion Investment Fund. And that's sort of a rough translation from the Mandarin, which is Hainan Qianyi Tozi Jijin. And they also raised this money from municipal investment funds from the city of Suzhou. And I think the most interesting part in all of this is likely due to the funding and the support coming from the local government of Suzhou. This apparently has justified Rocket Pi moving their people from the historical headquarters of Huzhou all the way to Taichung County in Suzhou. And from information that's publicly available, it seems that this Suzhou base will now be a manufacturing center for the company, while Beijing and presumably also um, Shanghai offices will be in charge of R&D. And I think what's um, what I want to add on that is that this game of musical chairs that we have uh, in the Chinese commercial space sector, especially for capex heavy activities such as uh, providing launch services, this is not something new. It's not something unusual. We've seen, for example, Deep Blue Aerospace move some of their activities from their historical base in Beijing all the way to Nantong. And with the interview that we had with Galactic Energy in last week's episode, we also uh, found out that their move partial move from Beijing all the way to Jinyang Chengdu was motivated also by the strong support that the local government was providing the company. So one last um, recent success regarding Rocket Pi that I want to talk about, and probably also a fact that makes them slightly different from all the other launch companies in China, is that they also plan to provide a business uh, around microgravity experiment services. And this would you know, start with a commercial microgravity platform called the Sparkle One, which they actually successfully launched for the first time on December 13th. So just a couple of days ago on board the Hua E1 suborbital rocket, which is a rocket provided by an absolutely stealthy launch company in Shanxi that we can talk about in a different episode. Um, and apparently this launch that took place a couple of days ago went well. The rocket reached 250 kilometers. The microgravity levels obtained by the Sparkle 1 were at 0.0001 G. And telemetry parameters were normal and the biological payload operated nominally. And so Rocket Pi seems to be one of those companies that believe strongly in the commercial microgravity business. It is already preparing a second commercial launch of their Sparkle 1 platform, apparently with uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, as well as Ray Jin Hospital. And they also mentioned, quote unquote, that further launches of the Sparkle 1 platform are to be expected in 2022. So talks about the commercialization of microgravity platforms and experiments aren't really new. And they're also uh, some of the reasons behind why we've been seeing a surge in commercial space station projects in the US in recent months. And speaking of which, if things work out as planned, Rocket Pi is planning to build a space biology lab after 2025. And this is according to an article published by the Global Times in March this year. So um, definitely a very exciting company to watch. Definitely a sign of an increasing level of commercialization in the Chinese space sector. And, uh, you know, just what a time to be alive and, and to watch these projects unfold. For sure. And uh, I, I'm drawing a blank on the, the CEO of Rocket Pie, although I know he has a two-syllable name. And uh, I just recall reading an interesting interview with him uh, a handful of months ago where he really talked about, you know, wanting to sort of musky in ideas of always wanting to colonize Mars and do do a lot of these very, very big, ambitious things. And so very interesting to hear that a space biology lab by 2025 is now uh, apparently on, on their docket. So good good luck to them there. Um so yeah, just a couple of additional small points to add. So I think it's interesting to note that Sujo is apparently trying to attract a second launch company. So as we saw in April of this year, uh, Tianbing Aerospace, also known as Space Pioneer, had a ceremony where they set up an intelligent manufacturing base in the Jiangjiagang district of Sujo, which is just up the, I believe, the Yangtze River, I suppose, uh, from Taizong, where um, where Rocket Pi has, has set up. And so Space Pioneer, this other company in, in Suzhou, because, you know, Suzhou needs multiple launch companies, um, they've moved very quickly, having completed five funding rounds in the past two years. And according to a recent interview with the CEO, they now have more than 120 employees, almost all of which have apparently come from either Cask or Kasik. And the interview from Space Pioneer also noted that their Suzhou facility would basically be used as an industrial base for rocket integration. Either way, a um, lot of commercial launch companies in China and quite a few of them having now set up near big rivers or uh, or other bodies of water. Um, so with that being said, uh, just a couple of last minute administrative points. So again, special thanks to our good friends at Mirror Atlas for the studio. Also a special thanks to our 
our most recent supporters, notably Ed Fife Design, KS, and Alex, all of whom have bought us some wonderful coffees over at buymeacoffee.dongfanghour.com. Um, special thanks also to our good friends at GoTikonauts and Spacewatch.global, two great sources of space industry news. And, John, anything else from your side this week? I'm all good. Thank you very much for watching. Okay. And uh, we will see you next week's episode. Happy holidays, and thank you for watching. Thank you.